I will invite uh, Benjamin to uh, be the first one in presenting his work in progress, uh, which is entitled Visualizing the Ancient Maya and Environmental Change. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. This is a project I'm working on with Timothy Thomason, who's also here, and we're, we're grateful to be here. Let's get started. So we're working on a way of developing visually um, an, ex of, an expression of the responses of the ancient Maya people to environmental change in the past through digital art. We're doing this through converting geochemical data and the archaeological site of Itzan uh, in northern Guatemala into a visualization using game engine technology to represent the changing population, vegetation, and climate of the, of the population center over 6,000 years. Uh, I'll first go over the background of the geochemical work and then talk about the artwork itself. So the lowland Maya of Mesoamerica were a complex ancient society living in the tropical forest of Central America. And they were affected by multiple environmental and social political stresses throughout their history, culminating in a major demographic and socio-political decline, sometimes referred to as a collapse during a period of intense drought. Uh, the effects of climate change on ancient societies are generally not well understood and remain incompletely constrained in the Maya lowlands. My PhD focused on reconstructing demographic and environmental change using geochemical proxies applied to a lake sediment core from Guatemala. Here you can see the location of Itzan, the blue dot on the right, uh, an orange box on the left, where an ancient Maya population center sits atop an escarpment next to Laguna Itzan, a cenote or a small lake. And the assumption of my work is that everything produced around the lake uh, where the purple star is, is transported, deposited, and preserved in the lake sediments. Um, and in, in this way, the lake acts as a kind of bin or trash can for things produced around it, uh, and they can make really high resolution records of change. So we take a, a lake sediment core from this lake, and we can extract various organic molecules known as lipid biomarkers from it. And, and then we have this record of change over time. And the first molecule I focused on was copper stanol, which is a, a stanol produced in the human gut. I quantified copper stanol over time as a proxy for human population change, with the idea that when there were more people living around the lake, more copper stanol was produced and transported to lake sediments. Um, and we see changes in population at different scales. Secondly, Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, are used as a proxy for fire. Uh, the Lowen Maya are thought to have used fire to clear forest land for space and agriculture. So a record of fire is informative in the way that the landscape was manipulated. Finally, isotopes of hydrogen and carbon tell us about how wet or dry it was in the past and how the ratio of forest to maize agriculture varied over time. Uh, for the bottom graph, more positive D13C values, it's delta 13C, suggest more maize agriculture. And overall, these data indicate that human population dynamics and patterns of land clearance for agriculture varied substantially, and that climatic change may have driven these patterns. And you might be thinking, okay, this is cool, this is, this is neat, but the graphs can be a little bit difficult to interpret. How, how can we read a story of, of these different proxies? Uh, do the graphs make you feel something? Do they make you feel anything? And Timothy and I are working on a way of visually expressing this, these data. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you about this endeavor. So the aims of our project are to take these incredible insights from geochemistry and archeology span at the site of Itzan um, that tell us about the interaction between the Maya and their environment, how agriculture developed, how people changed their landscape and responded to climatic and environmental change and turned them into a visualization. And the goal is to create an affectual experience that allows people to engage with patterns found in, in scientific data. 
So we start with archaeological maps that are provided by the archaeologist Kevin Johnston uh, of the site, and we use these to develop the architectural elements and layout of the virtual site of Yitzhan. We use GIS map data to generate height maps, and these maps are fed into Unreal Engine to tessellate the landscape in order to accurately produce a representation of the real world site in northern Guatemala. On the left, you have the height map data, and on the right, the displaced landscape terrain. Next, the scene is populated with higher levels of detailed geometry and uses procedural scattering methods to distribute vegetation, simulation effects, and other environmental elements which are dependent on the time period being represented. So you, 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 you saw this previously. We've selected four periods to demonstrate the variety of environments based on the proxy data. We'll move forward chronologically, so that's right to left, starting with the green box, uh, moving from a pristine forest environment before the presence of humans to larger populations and more significant landscape change. So the first period shows the area around Itzan before the arrival of humans, flora and fauna undisturbed by the arrival of human life. We have this sense of a, a pristine environment of possibility and also of some kind of baseline, a reference point for the changes that are to come. With the arrival of people to the area, a need for space, for habitation, for agriculture, fires start to have been used to clear areas of forest land to satisfy this need. The contrast between the previous scene is stark. The sounds of birds replaced by the crackling, sputtering, sizzling of flames. How were these fires controlled? How well established was this practice at this time? The Maya are thought to have engaged in Sweden agriculture where trees were burnt and cleared and crops planted and nutrient rich ash left behind. Of the plants cultivated by the Maya, maize has a special significance. The sight of maize growing neatly in the scene makes me think of the delicate balance struck between humans and the forest and the availability of water. The sounds of birds have returned. A different composition of plants and trees can be seen. The forest environment has been manipulated. Food is being grown, presumably for a growing population. Uh, sorry, Benjamin, uh, is there meant to be sound accompanying the the video? Yes, there is. We, yes. We tested this yesterday. Well, I'll, I'll uh, let you imagine the, the the tweeting of birds and the, the following of leaves. And, and I included the link to the video in the Google Drive, so people are invited to watch that. And in the final scene, we see the presence of houses in the space cleared in, cleared in the forest with roofs made from what look like palm weeds. And soon the video will feature larger populations and the effects of a changing climate, including the construction and eventual abandonment of the larger city of Yitzhan in response to drought. The Maya people adapted to dwindling water resources in various ways including the construction of reservoirs and other water management strategies. And I think it's important to include these efforts in the visualization. We hope that you can relate to the story of the Maya in a way that you might not have done by seeing the graphs at the beginning alone. It's our intention to illustrate the long time scale through carefully crafted imagery and simulation to fill in gaps in the geochemical record and explore possibilities of narratives in the past, and to invite spectators to contemplate their relationship to the broader histories and possibilities of a past, present, and future Earth, including our own reckoning with anthropogenic climate change. 
Thank you for listening and your questions, ideas and feedback are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, for, for, for that presentation. Um, we'll open up for a couple of questions for people. Um, I, th I see Etienne is raising his hand. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin. That was, that was great. Um, I was wondering, could you just say a bit about the, um, uh, maybe in the process of how the the proxies are established. I think it's a really fascinating question for Nasheen and I um, working with real time environmental data and how challenging it is for us to even establish some of these kind of baseline correlations between things. And so the extraordinary challenge of this for, for you guys and how you just just so maybe it's a little more um, clear how how those things emerge or uh, how you would secure the the index uh, or the or the proxy sorry as you call it absolutely fascinating yeah it's a it's a wonderful question thank you Etienne. so the proxy is very common in, in this field and it's basically using these different molecules found in the sediment as a proxy for what we don't have in the past which is direct observation so one limitation of, of these kinds of records is that they're mostly qualitative. We just have sort of a relative indicator of change in the past. So sometimes there's more of one molecule and less of another. And we, we say this is because there were more people or maybe there's more of a certain kind of pollen. And there are a few different modern studies that test the proxies in the modern day. So for example, last, I guess it was three summers ago now, I collected lots of sediments from the Yucatan and Belize and Guatemala along the transect to see how the, the, we, we can see these molecules in, in the modern day to see if there are these uh, patterns that we would expect in the past because we're assuming that the same processes that exist today and allow us to interpret them also existed in the past. And, and I can I would love to share more information about this. It's, it's fascinating to different ice cores and sediment records and cave deposits that are used to, to reconstruct environmental change. And, and then you can look at larger scales like uh, atmospheric circulation maybe, and these all feed into models. No, it's, it's totally fascinating. I, I'll also uh, share with you after a, a piece that I, our, our publishing house published about uh, a drilling project in Sulawesi in, in Indonesia, uh, in the Lake Tuwuti uh, drilling where they was the oldest record for, for Southeast Asia that has been ex extracted. But, um, but I'm just very interested in how you do the, the, uh, the, this contemporary thing of the validation. Uh, so thank you again. I, I really would look, look forward to following the project. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any any other questions or remarks for Benjamin? Maybe maybe I, I have a simplistic question. I I, um, I I I find the visualizations very very enticing, but I do I, I did thought, think that yes, it would be nice to have some sounds. So when when and how would you be launching into creating a sound design that would be just as uh, um, elaborate and detailed as the visualizations are? And how so would you go the about sound it? Is, is, is quite nice, actually. I just think I did not share the sound. Oh, OK. Um, can... <laughs> yeah. OK. We, we actually tested yesterday and it, it came through. So yeah. I'm not sure why it didn't today. Yeah. Maybe you can share the link again. I, I think it's in the it's in the paper, uh, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Maybe you can share it here in the chat if you have it under under your fingers. I will do, and and you can watch it at your own time. It's quite meditative, and you're you're struck by the 
as I say, the contrast between different scenes. So Timothy has done a lovely job. Yeah, of course, there's multiple questions when you're dealing with uh, with an ancient culture which uh, had music, but uh, it's it's um, um, to, to maybe create a historical representations of the music of the Maya. Is right. this is something that you went um, uh, embarked upon as well. We we yeah, haven't well, explored that, but I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Sorry, to and also me. moving forward, we're looking at like actually developing more kind of like architectural elements for the project. So you have these like pretty large cities with massive stone structures and we're actually gonna be kind of like generating these procedurally. <clears throat> so they actually basically are affected by like the different uh, variations of climate and things like this. Um, but obviously there has to be a ton of research that goes into that and like basically representing these architectural forms in a kind of historically accurate way something like that tim you might explain a little bit we talked about um simulating the decay of these structures after people have left there are ways of doing this using unreal engine yeah so yeah so there are ways basically to generate virtual geometry procedurally so basically creating a system in this game engine unreal engine it's called um and within that, you're able to like basically <clears throat> deform the geometry in different ways based on the data that you're inputting into it. Um, so basically, if there's, for instance, times when the cities are abandoned for like in uh, later periods of the record that we're looking at, um, you'll actually see the city being not kept and like the pieces of, for instance, pieces of stone being taken away, things like this, but all of these are able to be produced procedurally. Um, so that's kind of like an interesting aspect of using like real time computer graphics in this way. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, fantastic. And it'd be great to follow your project as it uh, develops. So thank you very much. And um, uh, we, we shall move on to our next presenter, who is uh, uh, Artemis Moroni, with, with absolutely the longest list of uh, co-authors in the entire DACA proceedings. So, and, and it's entitled uh, Gaia Senses, Mobile Application for Generating Audiovisual Compositions uh, from planetary platform, so a lot of GIS information, I take it. Please. Yeah. Can you see my screen? My name is Artemis. Just a moment, please. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to present Gaia Senses, a mobile application for generating audiovisual compositions from planetary platforms. This is a collaborative project that involves DCFCT, the Cyber Physical Systems Division of the Renato Arte Information Technology Center in Campinas, São Paulo, Brazil, where I come from. IA and NIC is the Department of Music of the Arts Institute of the, uh, and the Interdisciplinary NIC Nucleus for Sound Studies from University of Campinas or UNICEF. The Center for Meteorological and Climate Research Applied to Agriculture or CEPAGRI from UNICEF, the Faculty of Science and Technology of University of Coimbra, Portugal, our colleagues and students from the Mechanical Engineering and the Institute of Computing from UNICAMP Campinas, São Paulo, Brazil. Finding creative ways to put climate change in the spotlight is essential to motivate the participation that drives action. This proposal presents a collaborative project for the development of a mobile app, Gaia Sciences, accessing planetary bases for the generation of audiovisual works. 
that essence is perfect with my essence direction. Gaia is the essence personification, the ancestral mother of our life. Gaia, equivalent in the Roman pantheon, was Terra. Terra means earth in Portuguese. The Gaia paradigm proposed by James Lovelock suggests that living organisms interact with the inorganic surroundings on Earth to form a synergistic and self-regulating complex system that maintains and perpetuates the conditions for life on the planet. In 2006, the Geological Society of London awarded James Lovelock the Wallace Medal in part for his work on the Gaia the hypothesis. I has proposed the development of a mobile app through which people will periodically receive audiovisual works created with data from their local region concerning the local conditions. The app will generate an audiovisual composition from the user's GPS location. Accessing data from the weather satellite for environment analysis goal 16, made available by CIPAGRI, UNICAMP, and planetary platforms such as Google Earth Engine and Forest Watch. Here we present the Gaia Census Floor. The participant will access the application through their cell phones. The GPS position we send to the server that access the planetary platforms to get the parameters for generating the audiovisual work. Then the biosensis server um, the biosense service sends the composition to the participant's cell phone who can share it on social networks like Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter. In short, participants will periodically receive the Gaia post, a sign that reminds them of the importance of caring for the planet. Afterwards, participants will be able to regenerate and retrieve all the Gaia posts through their access to the Gaia Census Network. Here is a first prototype of the app. On the left, the guide says presentation screen. Then the login screen where the user can subscribe to the GaiaSense network. The third screen offers two options. Request a new composition or view the gallery. The fourth screen is a welcome message showing the user's local region data. Finally, the user receives a short video or animation referring to the geographic position. Biosensors will access data from the Goal 16 satellite of the CEPAGRI UNICAP, the Center for Meteorological and Climate Research Applied to Agriculture, to generate the audiovisual compositions. A state of the art satellite. Its dimensions are six meters by five meters by three meters, and it has a solar panel of about 20 meters in length and the weight of five tons. It collects meteorological data and images in the Western Hemisphere every 30 seconds providing an accurate observation of phenomena such as steeper storms, fire, smoke, aerosols, and volcanic ash. It has many instruments or sensors. We will work with the GLM and ABI instruments. The others are more related to data from the space environment itself such as ultraviolet, X-rays, and electromagnetism. The Jewish Light Matter 
provides great depth in data. A curious thing about Brazil is that it's the country with the highest incidence of lightning in the world. ABI, the diversity based light images, are the images themselves with 16 spectral beds. Each pixel in the image can be 500 meters, 1 kilometer, or 2 kilometers large. Most of the products of the low 16 are extracted from the images. The low 16 has several products available. Initially, we will work with clouds, winds, rain estimates, fires, and in NVDI, which is a compost in index related to vegetation. Sonification and other visualization are perceptual process with aesthetic and ecological ramifications which depend on understanding sensor processing, cognitive load, and multimodal correspondences. In the realm of sound, sonification of sound data has been telling the story of what climate change means for some time, turning data into sound and music. In 2015, Pereira presented the climate symphony. In 2018, this shaft from Stanford presented the composition 1,200 years of Earth's climate based on data compiled at Berkeley. And there are many other references. In the visual domain, also, ESO used the theory of weather as a basis for exploring ideas about experience, mediation, and representation in the weather project date more than 2003. Another term that appears linked to climate change is equal, as in this 2013 reference by Guy and Shaw and Hadish. In 2014, the term ethical aesthetics appears linked to climate change in a publication in Leonardo magazine and many other terms like public art, all of them bringing some awareness to the term Climate change. There are already climate change awareness initiatives through generative art, as in the Select Labs reference from 2020. In generative art, the design provides basic rules and then define the process, random or semi random, to organize the elements. Results continue to happen reading the stuff of the rose, but they can also be subject to subtle and even surprising changes. Furthermore, so generative algorithms have been used for some time to represent plants, as in minimalist phase work from 1996. Now, I'm going to present a demo with some audiovisual compositions. Um, Artemis, just double checking: yes. is, there is there meant to be sound with the uh, with the med media? We don't have. Don't you? I am to sing the sound. We, we don't have sound from you. So can no. you? Uh, I suggest uh, just stop the um, stop the presentation, and then you might have to uh, go out from the sharing screen, and then when you go back again, make sure that you click tick the button. Sorry, take the tick box at the lower left where it says computer sound. I don't. I stop share screen. Yeah, but there there is no sound coming through from you, from your media. Did you? 
do do you know what I mean about uh, um, when you do the share screen in Zoom? Mm -hmm. You have to tick tick the button where it says stop uh, share. Okay. Yeah. So stop share. Okay. And, and then, share and then, screen. And then you go back share screen, and mm -hmm. there's lower left. There's a little tick tick box. Share screen. Share sound. Yeah, try that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have to propose this project. I realized that KSS has a strong potential in technological and social impact to join efforts and generate synergies in different contexts. I think it will be quite complex from a technological point of view, but it will open up a lot of possibilities for us. We recently submitted Gaiasens to a foreign agents in Brazil. Gaiasens has been described as a transdisciplinary project in which artistic, scientific, and technological development appear intertwined. Still, the project is original in its artistic conception and it is in resonance with the contemporary threats in the field of art science. Chalbrink's an um, important social interaction component when addressing the ecological aspects. We the authors expect that this ecological act will afford tangible and intangible experience for the participants, eventually triggering new collective actions and awareness about the planet. We are in the age of big data, but each of us is unique. Also, like the butterfly effect in a great sport orchestra, each player has some plays a role. We hope that KSS encourages artistic creation and enhances actions to protect biodiversity against deforestation, triggering new collective actions and awareness about the planet. Because we are in a continuous process of recreation, always predicting and reinventing the future based on past and past present experience that should lead to a sustainable and symbiotic interaction with the world around us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Artemis. Um, great. That's a very inspiring and really a large project. Um, how, you know, within the timeline of creating all these all these tools, how, how, how far have you gotten at this point? Do you have a prototype version uh, already? Well, we are trying. Officially, the project starts on May, and 
advanced pieces and visual compositions from the data from satellite, which is, in my opinion, I am very worried about this, how to access the data satellite to in real time by an app. Uh, we are studying the data and we select the products that we will work. Sepagri team is helping a lot of us with this. And then uh, once we access the data and select the products that we are doing right now and the generate some problems, the visual animations were made well, not with the data of the satellite, but are models of the rain, of the plants, uh, text that we intend to use, the visual composition that will be, I think, uh, small videos from 20 to 30 seconds. And yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, small uh, animations with, uh, now with the data from satellite, trying to explore the uh, initiative. Uh, we found, I'm not worried because uh, my colleague Jonathan Mazzoni is, uh, is very smart on this. The soundtrack was from me and he has, has a lot of experience. Uh, usually he uses good data to generate the uh, soundtrack, his soundtracks, but uh, uh, now we are thinking on using unit environment because it's easier to treat image and sound in unit. Uh, thank you. And uh, we have time for one more question from, uh, from uh, somebody else. If not, I will. Uh, I suggest that we we uh, we say we say thank you to Artemis and all the best. We shall move to our um, next presenter, and that is, of course, Lukash Mirosha, <laughs> who I didn't uh, introduce uh, at, at the beginning, and uh, that is because he's uh, he's uh, such a good friend, uh, based here in Hong Kong, and we um, we uh, we we uh, go hiking and. Uh, and barbecuing and such but he's not here for that he's here to present his uh, own uh, art artwork which is called the torch bearers cave so please lukash take it away uh, thank you thank you hello everyone so i actually sent over uh, the video file to you because my internet connection is not that uh, uh, re reliable so if you can play it from your side and then you can talk uh, afterwards. Sorry, Lukash, again, I might, I, I really have a blind, blind spot here. So this is an email and yes, this is, is. you, you even re replied to that email. I, I so probably I'm quite did, sure it, you know. <laughs> I'm quite I sure said, it's there. Yes, uh, I, I um, but here it is. Very quickly, should I? I will download it. Yeah, just give us a little minute. Maybe you want to, uh, um, as I do this in a quasi real time. So okay. just, just, uh, just may, maybe a short disclaimer. It's uh, really a work in pro progress. A small in uh, uh, com in comparison to your grand projects that you presented before. It's a, it's a tiny one. It's a small small scale thing. I just. Uh, Okay. Uh, started working on that uh, basically two months ago, so it's really one one point oh uh, <laughs> version. And of course, it's a it's a it's a shame you can't uh, visit us here and and see it in 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 the gallery setup. But still, I I guess that the, I'm not guessing. I'm sure that the uh, organizers <laughs> did a great job, and the the online gallery setup is 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 equally good. Uh, Yes, and on that note, as we as I'm downloading here, so the uh, after our session here, there will be this um, 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 a, a tour of the gallery, so a virtual tour. What uh, Lina Simon and and uh, Rio Ikishiro will take us 
through the gallery and also it's also a meet the artist moment so Lukas will be there and to show you as much as possible with the hands-on when you when you actually well no spoilers but when you when you do the um, the, the interactive part of his of his uh, work here and and all the other uh, pieces in the exhibition but that's coming up in a little while okay I'm still downloading Lucas, this oh, is it's not a it's not a large large file. It's below one gig. I, yeah, I it's, guess. It's, yeah, it's slightly less than one gigabyte, but uh, you know, um, we are yeah, actually. That's why I've been, I've been I've been on and off uh, cam camera wise because I'm I'm on mobile five G basically. So uh, even though it's five it's five G, you know, not wired, so you never tell. Yeah, we we can hear. I mean, we can hear and appreciate your slightly robotic. Uh, artifact voice <laughs> okay but i'm not i'm not a disaster bot yet <laughs> not yet okay here we have it and oh, without thanks. any further ado i will share screen share sound desktop two and you will see there okay and here is the pre-recorded presentation hello my name is Lukas I'm a creative media theoretician and practitioner currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Academy of Visual Arts Hong Kong Baptist University before I begin uh, first of all, enormous thanks to the DACA organizing team and in particular to the DACA Art Gallery organizing team for making the event happen despite COVID challenges. Big shout out to them. And I'm also grateful that uh, even though we can't see the gallery and all the artworks uh, firsthand, the team prepared an online version of the gallery and invited me to deliver this short presentation on the work in progress project. I have been working on over the past few months. Thank you again. So the artwork is entitled The Torchbearer's Cave version 1.0. The post work in progress artwork uh, addresses the challenge in communicating key indicators of the current climate crisis. Specifically, I focus on the rising number of CO2 particles in Earth's atmosphere. The concentration of carbon dioxide, together with other greenhouse gases, has a profound impact on the rise of planet's water and air temperatures, which in turn deeply impacts ecosystems, both on land and in the oceans, and lies at the core of current climate crisis. I am using a combined creative potential of interactive 3D graphics and spherical photography to offer a more intuitive way of communicating a rapidly rising concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. I think that uh, despite growing public interest and media attention devoted to climate crisis, information about the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere still seems just like another type of abstract scientific data. And the proposed artwork challenges it by offering a more comprehensible way of presenting seemingly intangible decades-long scientific data on rapid rising level of carbon dioxide. And I'm using data from basically spanned over 250 years, as you can see. Now, let me just play um, the, uh, this is the screen grab of the interactive artwork. And let me just play it for a, for maybe a minute so you can get a general understanding of, of how the artwork is functioning and then I'm, and then I'm, then I'll proceed to the overview. Thank you. 
So there are two main layers of this real-time interactive installation, the visual and the auditory layer. Uh, in the first layer, the experience is based on several spherical photos taken in real-life locations, such as Shanghai, Venice, Hump, London, which symbolize the global significance of the phenomenon, which is the rising concentration of CO2 particles in the atmosphere. The images provide a snapshot, a still frame of how the detected urban areas look like in the present day. Strangely, even if the urban fabric seems to be intact, there are not many people clearly visible in the foreground, which introduces a dystopian post-apocalyptic mood into the experience, suggesting that, the, that, that this depiction is in fact an insight into one of the possible futures of our civilization, unless the global emissions of CO2 are drastically reduced. The installation has been equipped with a user-controlled input device. I call it a symbolic crystal ball. When being touched and manipulated by the user, it is controlling a spotlight type object in the application which is displayed on a high definition screen. Thanks to an interactive cone of volumetric light, one can visualize the concentration of CO2 particles in a specific area of the environment. The CO2 particles stay visible for as long as they are lit and disappear shortly after the spotlight is redirected. The application has been pre-programmed to alter the number of CO2 parts per million every 10 seconds, starting from the levels observed in pre-industrial era and by recreating more detailed measurements that have been taken continuously since 1960s. The loop cycle takes about two minutes to complete. The approach allows to the viewer to observe the rapid acceleration of number of CO2 particles in the atmosphere over the last two and a half centuries. Simultaneously, the auditory cues provided by the experience remain constant despite the observable changes in CO2 level. The soundtrack is actually an amplified frequency of the Schumann resonance which are a set of spectrum peaks in the extremely low frequency portion of the Earth's electromagnetic field spectrum. Schumann resonances are static global electromagnetic resonances. The constant flow, sorry, the constant low frequency sound is creating an experiential anchoring point for the viewer, a comforting assurance that not all the constituents of the Earth's homeostasis can be altered by human activity. My creative decision to use a user-controlled torch has also a more metaphorical meaning rooted in the role of light-based illumination in the Western culture, such as the Plato's allegory of the cave that, among others, postulates that only our exposure to light can bring often uncomfortable, however true knowledge in this case, the Torchbearer's Cave aims to bring truth about the pace of rapid acceleration of CO2 levels and their impact on the current climate crisis. Uh, so since the artwork is still a work in progress uh, project, I'm considering its further development uh, by increasing the number of real-time locations, uh, like more preloaded uh, 360 photos or adding Google Street View integration to cover more locations and maybe to offer yeah, on-demand lo location triggered by a user. And potentially uh, maybe also developing a VR version of the artwork uh, for a more immersive experience. Um, also, your suggestions are much uh, appreciated on that. I'm really looking forward to, to your input. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your time and looking forward to hearing your feedback. Uh, please uh, visit the uh, online gallery. Thank you again. Thank you, Lucas. Very nice presentation there. And um, um, we'll take some questions from, from our gathering. Uh, 
And if if we um, it, yes, there's a question from uh, yes. Morgan. Hello. Please. Go yes. ahead. I'm curious about the um, sequencing of the timeline, and um, it, it does it loop. So it um, loops. It's a it, it, oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. Finish. Um, Finish. Oh, it's uh, okay. also, <laughs> if it does loop, um, how you would think about um, that boundary with the phase repeats? Uh, so it's indeed it's a it's a looped ex experience. It takes about two minutes to uh, complete, and the so the assumption is that p that the audience won't stay too long at the you know, at, uh, in, in, fr in, in front of the artwork, there is a subtle boundary. I just make uh, uh, the number of particles, I just make them gradually, um, like gradually come down to the, to the first level, to the first levels, so to the 1750s. But it's done in a, in a quite gra gradual level. It takes about five seconds for, for, for the, less, let's say, extra, number of of uh, uh, particles to dissolve and they then they rest just 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 stays on the 1750s level and then it, it it's uh, growing again mm. so no like no 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 clear cut let's say mm. i i um to, to follow up i almost wonder if uh, might be a nice opportunity for some sort of prompt to the user mm -hmm. or or some sort of um you know a start start button or something like this mm -hmm. or or an ending or something like this or you know to be continued yeah interesting interesting like you can you you, you could even gam gamify it a bit and just you could say that you have like three three two 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 out of three lives left uh, <laughs> Unless you uh, limit your 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 CO CO two emissions, yeah, it's, it's an it's an it's an it's, a, it's an interesting right. take. Thanks or for one for fifth that. of an Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So. I, I think that uh, one of the things so for the sonification part, you, you did mention the Lorentz attractor, so maybe you can, uh, um, uh, and in fact, uh, Andrea Poli was also speaking about having, uh, using Lorentz uh, attractors uh, Schum in her work. Schum yeah, so Schum it, it, Schum Schumann's resonance, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's uh, okay. the Sorry, same. I'm, I'm, I'm not a sound guy, so it's uh, basically your... Uh, Aria, so you have to make sure it's the it's the same or not. <laughs> okay, I, I might have mixed that up. Can you can you explain a little bit the Schumann resonance uh, phenomena? So it's actually it's a it's a sonification of a very low uh, frequency, uh, and this is a this the those frequencies are actually ge generated by a lighting, by so by 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 storms. Uh, and in some fa fancy physical way that I don't really understand, uh, it uh, you can uh, register them as those super low uh, frequency sounds that is always that, that are always constant. They stay the same. It's like a, it's often in a in a in a in a popular in a in a popular culture. It's of, it's often uh, described as you know pulse of the of the earth or. or something like this because it's it's really constant so no no uh, matter how many of those storms are currently happening on the planet it's it's it just stays the the same i just i just really needed some something on the on the auditory level like a like i said like a more of an anchoring point for the for the audience to contrast the evolution of the of the visual level so this is how i ended up using those sounds so so those uh, uh schumann resonances that they, they stay constant over long time spans i mean you're dealing with 200 years uh... yeah some yeah some yeah 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 it's it's not it's not like a like a month and then you have to renew a, a subscription no no it's, it stays <laughs> stays stays for long 